works, but I have a little outline here. So starting with uh, exploration, which several of you kind of pointed at, right? Right now, uh, T-Space is a great archive, like that kind of dusty room with, with paper slips and stuff that you go in. If you really need to find something, you know it's there, you'll probably be able to find it. But it's not somewhere you go and hang out and let's see what's new on T-Space today, right? Uh, it's not, you know, if you go to the front page, even though it looks slightly better than in 2005, uh, it's still, you know, not something... Uh, and it's also a website that doesn't really, ch apart from you know, every few years when they redesign it, it's not a dynamic website, right? So you could go there today, you go there in three months, and you won't be very surprised. Um, and so, and, and you know, it's a shame because there's so much great stuff pr produced at U of T. Um, now, the stuff that's produced by professors mainly is stuff that is already published in journals. So in a way, yes, it would be great to highlight more of the work by U of T professors, but at least it's out there and it's hopefully being highlighted by journal websites. But talking about master's and PhD thesis, typically that's the only place they'll ever, uh, they'll ever be, right? Unless the, the student themselves do something to promote it, that is the only place. Now you don't even find it, the physical one in the library anymore, right? That used to be. I remember when I started my master's, I was like, one day I'll hold it in my hands. <laughs> Two years later, I'm like, here's the USB key. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what can we do? And I was, I was, so there's a few examples of things you can do, and I'm, I'm really happy with uh, what you showed the... Um, Research focus on focus on research. I think that's a great, and that's you know part of the you know T space or D space, which is the software behind this very complex package. But it's it tries to build on standards to enable people to build plugins or modules or even different software that works with it. So there is that option, and I think that's great. So uh, if we look at what Harvard has done as one example, if I, there we go. So this is actually using uh, I think the same software. And when you come to their front page, actually it's changed a bit since last time I saw it. Now they first kind of brag about themselves and they have all these uh, uh, quotes and stuff. But what's nice is that you come later and it's featured works. And so obviously you need someone to write this stuff, <laughs> right? It doesn't come automatically. But, you know, you get a work-study student, you have them write up a paragraph, you have a link. And so I don't know how often this changes. I haven't checked. But this is certainly something that if, if T-Space had it, I would check in once a month, or, or, oh, I wonder if there's anything new. In the, oh, th I know that professor. You know, Peter Penefather has a new paper, and it looks interesting. And you can click on it, and you can read it. And that's really powerful. It's powerful for us, but we're quite used to being able to click on stuff and reading it, because we have access to the university library. What about the broader community, right? Um, they are not used to that. Usually when they click on something, it says pay 50 bucks. So for them, this is all stuff that you can actually download and read. That's, that's quite powerful, and it's a great way for U of T to showcase itself. To, to the greater community. And of course, it wouldn't have to be all of U of T. It could be OISI, right? Educators, school teachers, wonder what's new at OISI. Oh, here's four articles that published that I can actually read that would be useful to me. So that's, that's kind of neat. And it could be done in many different ways. And you could even do something um, more automatic because most of the papers on T-Space have an abstract. And some of them might even have a picture. There could be a field for uploading a relevant picture. And then you could do kind of a Pinterest kind of thing where you just pull in a few of the latest ones that have pictures and abstracts and rotate it. So it wouldn't have to be that hard. Now, another thing that inspired me is this thing. It's actually uh, something from Norway. It's called the Master Blog. And it's uh, a blog uh, to feature master students because you know, PhD students, they go on, they write articles, they publish books, but master students, their thesis could be really good, but often they're not really getting a lot of attention. So what they do is they invite students to write a blog entry about their thesis. So it might be 500,000 words, should be fairly easy to understand, invite you to put pictures, invite you to put YouTube videos, you know, make it interactive. So it's not just a cut of your thesis, right? It's kind of a, a popularization. But at the end, of course, there's a link to the repository where the full text thesis is. And again, this is something, so the, the first here is about uh, Vikings. <laughs> it's very Norwegian. Do women have to be naked to get into use? Okay. Um, yeah, so, but, but, you know, for me, this is something I could definitely find myself browsing, even fields I'm not interested in, because it's written in a popularized way, and, uh, uh, and then, you know, you go and, and you download the thesis. Again, this is something where you ask people to do it, but it wouldn't, again, take a lot of work to set up such a blog and put out the, the invitation. And, and, you know, if people don't want to do it, that's fine, but if they do, then that's a great way to showcase uh, U of T or individual departments. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now, 
I, did, I, I so I was inspired by this, and I thought because uh, TSpace partly builds on open, you know, they try to use open standards and stuff. I thought, well, I wonder what I can kind of create very quickly. And because they have, um, you can get RSS feeds from many of their collections. And so I set up a very simple blog on my own site. So you see, it's Mian. It's not something U of T official. And what it does is it just sucks down all the abstracts from new theses that are posted, and it just posts them as blog entries. So this is, uh, and I set it up like a year ago. It just keeps running. Let's see, the last one is October 19, 2012. I haven't looked at it for a year. It just automatically updates. And so, you know, it's whatever people posted as their abstract. And then you click on the title, and you get the PDF. So very, very simple. And with some work from TSpace, the problem is that these aren't actually categorized. And so for me, it would be much more interesting to see the ones from faculty of education rather than medicine and chemistry and whatnot. But you know, that's just an example of what you can do when you have something that uses open standards and when you start playing on building those layers around it. Because the main function of TSpace is really to preserve your stuff forever and make it stable. Okay? And that's something that none of us can do. If I put it on my blog, I might be able to publicize it much better. I might be able to have a really beautiful interface, but I can't promise that it will be there in 100 years. Okay, we might not even have web servers in 100 years, right? And that's something that the library is really good at. And when it, so that core function, we should never compromise. But on top of that, we can then build different ways of accessing the material. So Gabriel, does Keyspace um, preserve uh, faculty blogs, faculty members? Do you have a place for archiving work that's like They provide last year. Okay. So you just you just send the file to the perspective we have a format. But yeah. Are there any advances that can make us like cross-searching multiple institutional repositories? Because it seems that unless you know something's published there by a specific mm -hmm. scholar, then it's kind of lost. I hate to say it, but it's impugned in many ways in the two space. My first thought was to the space, which is a So let me actually talk to that because that's, that's one of the things I'm, I'm going to just uh, come back to this. So um, I think that's a really important point, right? Because we want to find stuff. We don't care where it is. Um, the thesis, okay, if we went to UFT, it'll be there. But a lot of times it's a professor who published something and then they also put it on T-Space, which means we get access. We don't know that. We don't really care. Um, and Oftentimes, you, you'll get, so there are some, some service that collect these uh, specifically, and then you have Google Scholar, for example, that tries to search everything. And that's where you, you know, oftentimes what it's really good at is collecting multiple versions of the same paper. So it might have a link to, to Elsevier and say, you know, here's the official one, but by the way, you also put this PDF here, so you can just download it without a password. And that's, that's really nice how it brings different things together like that. But the problem with Google Scholar um, is that uh, it's two things. Okay? The, the first thing is that typically Google's, even though um, TSpace, for example, offers semantic metadata, right? That's one of the strengths, as opposed to putting it on my blog, is that you know what the title is, you know who the author is, you know what the data is. Uh, Google Scholar typically doesn't actually care about that because I think the reason is that they scan so many different repositories that present that data in so many different ways. That what the, and maybe they've also come across a lot of them that are like half broken or whatever. So they don't really trust that data. And so from my experience, what they end up doing is that they either just scan the actual web page and try to guess the information, or they just scan the PDF. And so they're, okay, this is really big writing. It should be the title, right? <laughs> and the result of that, if, so if, if some of you have used Google Scholar a lot, is that the information is often very, it's half, half-assed. Um, and for example, I had a paper that I wrote for, it wasn't published, it was written for a class in my undergrad, and I saw the title page was like, you know, Professor uh, Anne Emanuel Byrne, uh, 
class on health policy, it's Dean Hawklev student, da 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 da, right? And so it showed up in Google Scholar as Anne Emanuel Byrne and Stian Hawklev, 2005. And I'm like, oh, I, you know, I, now people think I co-authored it with her. And then it got cited in the medical journal. <laughs> and I wrote it in the second year of my undergrad. And I'm like, I wonder if they would have cited it if they didn't think that this internationally famous professor was behind it. But now I feel really bad. And so, you know, because they just scanned the PDF. And also, there's no way of actually contacting Google Scholar. If you go there and say, oh, I want to correct this information, uh, they say, well, you know, go back and change the PDF, and then the next time we come by and read it, maybe we'll interpret it differently. There's no actual way of saying, correct this thing. they got to get their math guys on it. <laughs> like, but right. But, but, so, go up and down the, the, the steps. Yeah. So, like, like, he's just, but yeah, that, but that's... Can we just get a little webcam? You know, you go into the library and they just scan. But that's actually a great, great segue, because the second problem with Google Scholar is that it's not open. Okay. And it's exactly the same problem as with Google Maps. Um, <coughs> now, both Google Maps and Google Scholar are amazing. I wouldn't want to live without them. Uh, and so for a long time, when you had things like OpenStreetMap, which some of you might have heard of, it's an open source kind of Wikipedia-like uh, way of trying to collaboratively map the world. Um, people are, why are you even spending all your time on this? We have Google Maps. It's free. Everyone loves it. It's awesome. And in the same way, we have Google Scholar. Why would you try to build an alternative to Google Scholar when it's really awesome? And it's free to use, right? Well, you can export right. You can't, so for example, so yeah, there's all kinds of restrictions. If you want to use Google Maps in your own app, it used to be free. Now, if you have more than, let's say, 10,000, you have to pay Google quite a lot of money. So a bunch of apps started using OpenStreetMap. Uh, you can't you know, control how you access it. So, so Apple, I mean, this is a long discussion, but Apple wanted you know, turn by turn directions, and Google said, no, we want to keep that for Android, <laughs> right? And so that's part of the reason why Apple had to change the mapping server. You can't uh, download, you know, a map is kind of made of these polygons, and then they use those poly polygons to draw the map tiles. And the map tiles can be drawn in very many different ways with different color schemes and all that stuff. Uh, you can't download the polygons. So you can't, the only thing, you can actually get exactly map tiles that Google has rendered in the same color scheme, with the same placement of, of names and everything, you can't get a data set behind it, right? And you can't download any of, of it offline unless Google is making the app for you, like they did on Android. You can download a city. On um, um, uh, Apple, you couldn't. But some, someone created an app called Off Maps where you could, but it was using OpenStreetMap. So either way, you know, in, initially people were saying OpenStreetMap is kind of just a silly uh, exercise, and now a lot of companies are actually building on it. And so, in, in the same way for Google Scholar, um, because my background is that uh, I've been working on this open academic workflow, which is trying to integrate with all these services and make things easier. So I want to be able to go and do a search in Google Scholar in the background and get you know, the five top hits and then show it to the user using my interface. And I can't do that. Not only do they prohibit it, but they technically, aggressively try to pre prevent anyone from automatically searching, right? Uh, you can't query it in different ways. You can't find out where the data is from. And there's all kinds of limitations. So if we have all this, you know, we have how many thousands and thousands of uh, repositories. Let's see where did I put that? Uh, okay. No, I can't find it. It's a problem with not having slides. Uh, you have this uh, repository of uh, the, what's it called? The, Registry of Open Access Repositories, which has you know thousands and thousands of open access repositories, which is pretty neat. And together, they have hundreds of thousands, probably millions of articles. In fact, some of these repositories that are not institution-specific, they're discipline-specific, like Archive with an X for physics papers or RepEC for economics paper, have more than a million papers each. Okay, So there's an incredible amount of information out there with the semantic metadata from these organizations that want to share, and yet if internet was working, I could show you. And, and yet if you go to that website and you click search, what you get is a Google search of, the, of, all, of all, all those member websites, right? So now, from my kind of perspective as, as kind of a tiny hacker who likes to build those kind of things like the blog I just showed you, like using very simple technologies, part of the problem is that uh, DSpace and all of these things are typically built by information specialists from information schools 
you know, computer scientists using very fancy uh, protocols, okay, which are really high standard and probably ISO certified and all, all oh, there we are, right? So if I go to search here, and, wow, it's really slow today, and I type in, whoa, that's a advanced search. That's the default search form. Yeah, anyway, uh, you, I'm not going to waste time on that. Sorry? Oh. Advanced search is the default. So if I type in my own name, because I know I have several things in the U of T repository. Oh, finds nothing, great. <laughs> A anyway, anyway um, so, you know, so for example, I wanted to see if uh, there's any uh, metadata uh, exposed on, 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 on the T-Space page, because uh, they have this uh, OAI interface, right? And I've actually played around with it. It's actually very complex. If you just want to, let's say you want to make a Chrome plugin that when you're on a T-Space page, you click it and it adds it to your bibliography, like Zotero does, okay? Then building that around OAI is actually like a lot of different steps, right? What you ideally want is just to have some metadata hidden on that page that you can read like as a machine. So I wanted to see if they have anything, and they do. Um, so this is, this makes no sense to some of you, but if you just do view source on a normal T-Space page, you get all this stuff. And this is, DC, so this is the Dublin core, which is a metadata bibliography, uh, very, very, you know, probably hundreds of pages of, of, of definition, right? Um, which is nice because it has, okay, so who's the contributor? It's this department, or what's the abstract URL? It's this one, so it's, met, it's semantic, okay? Everything is in the right place. The problem is I don't know a single uh, ref, uh, citation manager that can read this format. And when I tried to Google for any open source script that converts this to any format that the citation manager can read, the only thing I found was a question I myself posted a year ago on this question and answer site, which is always kind of sad because there were no answers. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just show you, so I'm not saying this is bad. This is actually much better than a lot of websites out there. But um, I'll just show you an, an alternative using kind of simpler technologies, um, which is like RSS, which is what people, I think, find easier to play with. Because this isn't really made for people playing with it, and that's, that's fine. So this is a, a web page generated by, by my uh, uh, workflow, right? It's a wiki page. But in addition to having, so this is what you can call human readable. Okay, this is a standard citation. It's not semantic. You'd have to try to parse it. And you're like, okay, I think this might be the year. This might be the author, but I'm not sure. But in addition, I hide here the BibTeX. And the BibTeX is a machine readable. So you see it looks similar. Book title is this. Red, you know, title is this. Okay, so it's, it's a similar. But the difference is that this format is readable by almost any citation manager on the market, including EndNotes, including Bookends, including uh, Zotero, including whatever you want to use, right? And so, and because I also, talking about open access, right, I also include the URL here because when I downloaded this, it was an open access publication. So I stored the URL. And now, if someone else, so this is actually on my friend's web page, she's using my system. And if I now come here and I say, hey, this looks really interesting, I want to import this into my system, okay, I can press one, hopefully this works now doing it live, I can press one button combination, and nothing happens. Um, but it might still, it might be very slow today, or it might not work. Um, it's interesting. Oh, there we go, it does work. So. This is the key, okay? So not only, so I pressed one button, you saw me, no tricks. Um, not only did it import all the metadata and put it in the right field so I didn't have to type that, right? But it found the URL and it said, hey, I'm gonna automatically download that URL and link it to your um, citation. So now it's in your system, okay? Right now, that only works with my system. But the point is, I'm using all open standards. And so anyone else could, ease, and Sotero probably would actually just recognize it because it's an open standard, right? But, um, but I think we need to look at, uh, you know, so I want to do that, I want to enable that for, for T-Space, but I just can't figure out how I can take those doubling core things. And, and that might just be as simple as writing a simple little library. But those are the things that enable more normal people who aren't like endless 
folders to, to kind of make those little hacks on top of it. Well, that's an example of design. You're just trying to do those little hacks, those little lines But but that, so so that's one thing. But but talking about the search engine again, okay, and coming from blogs, which I think is a, a really interesting example of an, a distributed architecture, right? Which is what these repositories should be as well. Um, a lot of you might have blogs. I don't know if you know about Pingomatic. So but but you probably all use it. So what Pingomatic does is that if you use WordPress, for example, or most other blogs, when you post a blog uh, and you press submit, it pings. Pingomatic. What it does is say, hey, pingomatic.com, um, I just posted a new blog entry, and here's the URL. Okay, so that's the only thing it sends is the URL. It says, new blog entry. What does Pingomatic do? Well, a lot of search engines subscribe to it, or they ping, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but either way, Google then gets an update from Pingomatic, and they say, in the last five hours, here's the new 10,000 URLs that were just updated. And Bing gets an update, Yahoo gets an update. Anyone who wants to can subscribe to Pingomatic, and then Google goes and indexes your page. And that's the reason why when you're Googling for something, uh, you know, you might get a blog entry that was written five minutes ago. Whereas if I write something on my wiki or on my non-blog website, you know, it's going to come by once a month or something to kind of update, right? Very, very clever. What if we had something similar for uh, T-Space or even open access journals, right? Similar with open access journals, almost all independent open access journals are run on open journal systems, which is another open source tool that we could change to include this. So when you publish a journal article or when you upload your thesis, it sends a ping to Open Scholar or Matic. And that ping contains the semantic metadata for that article in whatever, if it's BibTeX or if it's Dublin Core, whatever is, is commonly readable, and a URL back to the article. And ideally, that metadata also contains the license, right? This is an open access draw, uh, article. This is Creative Commons, or it's not, right? This has no, a, a PDF available, or it doesn't. And then people could subscribe to that. You know, maybe I can subscribe to say, I want to get pinged about everything that has this keyword. Or maybe you have then an open scholar or a search engine that's actually built on the semantic metadata and not of running around and guessing what, what, an, what the metadata is, right? So that's something that we could, you know, A, we, we can't do it by ourselves, but but you know, I'd love to see someone at the Faculty of Information work with the library to actually start building this thing and maybe get other people on board. I think another aspect of design is you actually have to imagine that it's possible. Not, well, not in the science fiction type of way, but actually know enough about how things are built to say, yes, this can go into that and you can create a sketch of something that can be presented to someone who might want to know more about it than you, but at least And continuing on this thread of, of thinking of Web2 technologies like the blog, right? Um, one of the, pro you know, we talked about this conversation. Uh, the problem is that uh, if you go to a, a detail page on T-Space, you know, there's no way for you to leave feedback. There's no comment button. Now, of course, if there was a comment button, there would, that would introduce all kinds of problems. <laughs> you know, and I understand that. I'm not naive. But that doesn't mean that we should just give it up. Because I've come across publications where I'm like, wow, this is really awesome. Now, personally, having my stuff on T-Space, I would love for people to tell me they've read it. Because T-Space, here's, so here's the statistics, by the way. So if you go on your, if you have a publication, this is my um, master's thesis, and you see that nobody downloaded yeah? Well, in January, three people downloaded it, yes, <laughs> right? Did they ever read it? Did they like it? Did they just click on the wrong link at the wrong time? I'll never know, right? And in fact, if they want to find me, now, luckily, I have, I'm the only one in the world with my name, so I'm fairly easily to Google, and I should try to stay out of crime, but <laughs> <laughs> or embarrassing Facebook pictures. But for you know, if, if the if the guy wrote this called Henry Lee, then and I've been in this situation. You try to find him. There's no link back to where he comes from, right? There's no link to his. And one interesting technology that I wonder if if T Space will be incorporating, but which you know could be when just when it comes to identity, is something called Orchid which is an uh, attempt to create these universal uh, researcher IDs so that you know, you're kind of registered and then whenever you publish something as the idea, uh, you'll have a number or something that you put there as well. And then, because there's actually a huge problem, for example, you talked about citations, right? Uh, people get hired or fired, well, 
probably not hired. They certainly get not hired, uh, <laughs> depending on how many citations they have. It turns out people from, let's say, Latin America get their last names misspelled so often that their citation counts in databases are much lower than they should have been. And you know, people from China, and also this silly uh, idea of like just having the initials, which I'm like we have enough space now to actually write the full name, but still most citation standards ask you just have the initials, so you have Lee comma X. I challenge you to find me within 10 minutes the contact information for Lee comma X, right? <laughs> it's impossible. And yet, I, I just read this article, and it was awesome, and I wanted to contact him. So it's trying to solve that, and it would be great if you know, eventually that was actually integrated with T-Space and open journals and stuff like that. I'm just curious, with, uh, with T-Space, how do you identify the, 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 the faculty member by their uh, UP uh, faculty, uh, faculty uh, member? Or? See, that, that's the funny thing, because there's so many of these social citation sharing sites right now, and Academia is, is a big one. It's focused more on connecting to people, but it has journals, but there's Mendeley, there's Site You Like, there's you know probably a bunch of other, other ones. Part of the problem with those, and they could be part of the solution, but you know typically, they don't share their citation databases. <laughs> it's not open. If I want to download the citation database from Mendeley, which has millions of articles that people have been uploading, you know, it's a commercial company. Right? They're doing a lot of great stuff, and nothing's bad to be commercial, but they're not interested in sharing that, and they're not interested in linking it up between. So, so there's still that kind of, um, it's like almost there, but not quite. Right? And, but but they, are, you know, they could benefit hugely from having some kind of a, uh, authoritative central database, like you know, using pings to bring in all the metadata, and then they could build all that social infrastructure on top of it, but that would actually be the one that linked, for example, an entry in Mendeley with an entry in academia. Right now, you, you have to do fuzzy logic. So you have this citation looks like that one. Could be the same article, but we're not sure. Right? So that's, um, so I just want, just a few brief things. So, you know, we talked about exploration, talked about people bringing people to the site and, and making people excited about reading stuff. Another problem is obviously how do we make people excited about posting stuff? And for master and PhD students, that's not a problem. We force them. Um, academics aren't as easy to deal with, unfortunately. Uh, and I, I, we tried to get a, an open access mandate at OISE, and our idea was not to force anyone, our idea was to convince the faculty council to mandate themselves, which they've done in a lot of different schools. But apparently at U of T, you know, there's the unions, there's the question of whether the faculty council is even allowed to do that, maybe they have to ask the School of Graduate Studies permission to mandate themselves, and it was, so in the end we have an open access policy. But either way, so I know how hard it is to force academics to do anything. Um, but we can encourage them, right? And what are ways of encouraging them? One, I, I mentioned this idea of feedback, right? If you hear about people reading a paper, as opposed to it's just a black hole, that's going to be encouraging to you. And um, so if you look at, so they actually, I think initially you couldn't see your own statistics, but now you have these statistics. Um, but still, they, they're not, um, you know, so if you compare these statistics with, YouTube, which is actually a great example. Now, I've already showed you statistics from my own website, so you know the amount of information that gets captured by website. Now, if you don't have your own blog, but you're putting stuff on YouTube, um, they actually, so this is a, a, a publication I put on, it's a screencast on a fairly geeky topic, as you see, uh, but somehow almost 900 people have viewed it, or at least have clicked on it, right? So again, I'm like, where did these people come from, and did they even watch the whole thing, or did they just, <laughs> oh my god, like get me out of here as soon as possible. And the cool thing is, you know, you can actually see all these kind of crazy stats here. 
So YouTube can tell you, um, they can tell you, uh, you know, how many minutes they watched. They can tell you where they come from. They can tell you that 90% are male, so typically a very geeky topic, I guess, uh, sadly. Yep, yep, and it actually tells you, if you click on the right way, it tells you where they stop watching, <laughs> which is kind of cool. <laughs> so here you see, you know, you have a, so this is how many percentage leave at any point. So like, yeah, their average number, average, and then I do something here that like really keeps their interest, but they're like, nah, and then they start leaving again, right? So this is a weird, geeky screencast. I'm not sure how useful this is, but for like, you know, That's Right, so you can you can look at this. You can look at where did they come from, which typically is what I'm most interested in. And you see that, uh, so for example, five people came because they were watching another YouTube video, and Google YouTube suggested this video. And what was the other YouTube video? Oh, that was another video that I made about a similar topic. So it makes sense that people would be interested. I guess the question is what you're really seeing these suggestions. Why don't we have all this attached to some sort of database? Well, even even more specific than that, when I go to, so I'll give you a very specific example because back in the days I actually got access to the, the statistics for um, the underlying statistics for T-Space uh, because I was uh, we, were, we were talking about how we could improve it and so I was like I would love to see where do people come from to T-Space. We know that most people come from Google. What do they type into Google? Right, that's interesting. But not all everyone comes from Google. Um, a bunch of people come from Wikipedia. Okay, and so there's actually scattered links to T-Space pages all around Wikipedia. And here's an example. This is from the Italian Wikipedia about the uh, lingua romagnola, so the, the Romanian, the Romanian language. And if you go down here, I didn't read all of it. Um, this seems like a fairly detailed article. Uh, here you see the three, third article. Here's a, a reference to uh, a thesis, which T-Space. Right, and so that's pretty obscure. It's a, it's a long, long, detailed article on the Italian Wikipedia on the third footnote, links to T space, and yet you know there was twenty people a, a month coming from this article specifically to read that thesis. Okay, that's pretty cool. What's weird is that guy doesn't know it. I know it, but he doesn't, right? Because that information isn't isn't uh, surfaced. Okay, if he got an email. Uh, or if it, it was shown to him, did you know that? I mean, now for all I know, maybe he put it there himself. It's not impossible, and right? It's his family that's putting it. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> but you know, there's other examples. If you go to the Wikipedia article on triage, like medical triage, uh, uh, the citation number thirty. So you you have to really go down there. Is to a T space article, fifty sixty hits a month, and so you know those people are really interested. They're not just randomly clicking around, right? They are really interested in your topic, and they are Wikipedia users who probably wouldn't have access to your article if it wasn't some journal, right? So that's the other thing. These aren't necessarily, this is outreach beyond the academic community, which is pretty cool. And you could probably even put that in a grant application, because they're talking a lot now about knowledge mobilization. But they don't even know this stuff, right? So surfacing this in kind of a user-friendly way. I published, from my bachelor thesis, I have published two journal articles. One in kind of a, a prestigious, I mean, not the most, but like a decently prestigious journal that's also printed and all that stuff. And one in, in a fairly crappy, to be honest with you, open access journal. Now, most open access journals aren't crappy, but I read the articles and most of them were fairly bad. But I was just like, I have all this stuff, it's not good enough to, I'm, I'm just going to, I want to put it out there. Now, what happened after that? For the one, the prestigious journal, I have no idea, because I've never heard from them, don't have access to any statistics, nobody cited it. I mean, I'm presuming someone read it, but I just don't know. I mean, I could put it on my CV, it looks nice. For the other one, I get an email every single month telling me how many people downloaded it. And it's always 20, 30 people. So in a way, I'm like, that's really cool. This crappy journal actually, in a way, is, is stroking my ego <laughs> at least more than this fancy journal, right? So anyway. It wouldn't show up as a citation. The downloads are not. Well, exactly. So, so there's also this disconnect, right? Because obviously, if I'm applying for a job, that prestigious journal will count a lot more than the, than the open access journal. Uh, but in, in the case of many of our, our scholars here, they've already published their journal. So the question isn't where they go to publish. The question is, do you take the five minutes extra it takes you 
to upload the article to TSpace, where in 70% of publishers already give you permission to do so, okay, without you even asking for it, right? But you have to do it yourself. So if we can show you that, hey, that's actually worth your while, right? Okay, so absolutely final thing, but back to this metadata thing, okay? Because there's this amazing paper, it's, it's so simple and, and so good, comparing uh, acad I, I might have mentioned it first class, comparing the handling of academic uh, metadata to MP3s, right? And how it's so easy for us to throw MP3s into iTunes, change all the genres, throw it on a USB key, put it into a Linux computer, fire up uh, you know, some other music program, it has all the genres there, it has all the, you know, you can, you can put in a CD with no metadata, it will actually go to a database and find the fingerprint of that music file, and download all the track information, right? When back in the days when we used to scan all of our CDs when MP3 players came out. So this, this was like a solved problem 10 years ago. And yet my downloads directory is full of full text one PDF, full text two PDF, full text three PDF. And I drag it into my citation manager and I go and find the metadata somewhere. Now, the point is, it is actually possible to embed metadata in a PDF. Right, the PDF format allows that, just like the MP3 format allows that. There is open source software that will embed uh, BibTeX, as one example, into the PDF. There are already citation managers that will read that BibTeX automatically. So you drag uh, a file on it and boom, everything's filled out. And here's just one example, which I saw which is pretty cool. So it actually integrates, this is for Linux, but it actually integrates with the Finder. So if you open a bunch of PDFs in this is just a finder, it's not a citation manager, it'll just nicely show you all the metadata as well. Just automatically. Right? See, that's the point. We can live in that future right now. I know. If you vote for me for the 2012 <laughs> presidential election. I know how to make that happen. <laughs> Sorry. No, I don't think like it's it's sickening that this yes. technology exists. Right now, it's implementable, and no one is. It, right. it, it, it makes me want to throw up. Right. There's business plans in the way. Well, but that's the thing because we have T space which we control, and so how hard would it be? And I'm not going to put you on the spot, but you know, to have it so when you upload your PhD thesis, we already know the metadata. All we need to do is stamp it onto that PDF, and again, open source libraries to do that thing works. Probably a few lines of code. I know it's much more complicated than that. But this is not like the frontiers of knowledge. That's actually one of the problems. From my kind of research into this, I find that there's this gap uh, where you, know, you have most open access advocates focus on policy. You know, all, like open access to, uh, conference, almost all the focus is on how can we convince them, how can we have open access mandate, how can we convince the funders, blah, blah, blah. Then you have a few people who are maybe from faculty of information who are far out there and who are talking, who are like uh, Anita the Ward, who was here last year, who's talking about you know semantic publications, data linked together in 3D vertices, blah, blah, blah. And in the middle, you have this space of things that are fairly doable right now, which is most of what I've talked about, but it's not gonna get you a publication in a, in a fancy information science journal, because it's not new. And I don't know quite well, where you get people to work in that space. I, I, I feel like it, this, this is true, but I feel like if people started using this, if this was implemented, it would redefine the way it works, right? Like, if all this metadata was embedded, and like if everyone just started using this and saying, stuff would rise in front, and if you could put, if, I don't know, if there was like an iTunes for academic articles, whatever, iTunes U, I don't know what they're doing there. I don't well, they, really, they, they tried to, actually there was a, uh, but, Apple University. Yeah, but but that that whole the thing is is it's sortable, it's intelligent, we can track back to it. The, the technology exists, it's 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 all in place. And what it would do for accelerated accelerating knowledge, there I, I'm sorry, but there is money in making information travel faster and more effectively. And I I don't know if it if it's yes, you're not going to sell journal articles. But the ideas that are being disseminated and the creativity and the engineering that's going to happen because of that shared communication will have a larger economic impact that you like, can't measure the impact of that. That's, right? that's where the, so that's just because you're not going to get 99 yeah. cents, because 
you didn't make someone pay for the, the, yeah. their journal access. It's pathetic. It's, it's, this is where the, it doesn't actually have to be private enterprise. Yeah. The libraries have been around forever. Yep. I mean, the, there's tremendous uh, uh, investment in the library infrastructure. A little bit of, uh, of investment to get maybe two of you instead of just one of you. <laughs> Or, or maybe a, a, you know, some kind of a innovation uh, fund around the key space that would be funded, even at the level of two hundred thousand dollars a year. You know, those for some small projects, which have tremendously enhance the, the role of the library and its uh, function. The the, uh, the the metadata stuff. I mean, it comes back to the, the black box thing. You know, there there is a plausible deniability is very useful. You know, sometimes you don't want to. But I mean, for, again, for someone who likes to, to, you know, hack around with connecting different services, and that's because that's so easy now. And, and the fact that I can go to a conference and literally, you know, spend five minutes doing a script that shows a 3D visualization of all the tweets and who has retweeted whom and what are the social relationships. And I'm, I'm not, because those libraries exist, not because I'm brilliant, right? But because, well, because all the data is available in a standard format and because those libraries for visualization, for social network graphs, for all of that stuff exist, you plug it together and people do this like on a, on a handcuff, right? Trying to do the same as you were saying for academic articles, right? Here's a hundred academic articles in my citation manager. Can you show me which paper is cited the most from those papers, right? That should be like, Click on the button, yeah. but it is uh, well, uh, the last uh, November lecture where I was, um, was Leslie Chen and we'll talk about it. Actually, I uh, needed the award as part of something called Force, uh, Force 11. So I'll make a link to that. It's, uh, it's a movement of uh, remnants of the semantic web people and, and uh, publishers. But it's all about you know, uh, aggregating this type of uh, mobilization technology. So that not only would the paper metadata be available, but also the content, so that you could have like, paragraphs or pictures or tables that could be rapidly found. So you go through the data to the paper rather than from the paper to the data. Well, I, I guess if you think back to, um, I don't know if it was a kind of graph or something, you know, that spectrum between data, information, knowledge, and who Who brought that in? Yeah, but like to, to me, that's that's the fundamental problem with, with, with all this. Is that right now, the data isn't even being logged properly, right? And we, we, we haven't built the infrastructure to turn that data into information, right? And that that's that's what I think I've seen. I mean, you know, that's like if you put the data in there, we have the systems to turn it into, 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 into information, so we can actually. Build knowledge and build communication between between each other, right? Like, and the the, the thing I didn't even get to, because all, all I talked about was we have these PDFs. How can we find them? How can we find the metadata? How can we index them? How can we link to them? But what if we go beyond the PDF? There was actually a conference called Beyond the PDF a few years ago, which I had the chance to go there. I know Leslie went. But just as an example, and this is a super superficial example, but you know, this is my master's thesis exactly as the U of T wants it with, you know, page numbers. At, uh, they've got all kinds of crazy, and I wonder who came up with it, but it's, you know, the first page number of each chapter should be at the bottom in the center, and then for each subsequent page should be on the top of the right. I'm sure that makes it very, I'm sure that makes it better. But, you know, in, in, as I showed you in the first class, in addition, I made uh, a printable version that, uh, nothing works today, uh, looks like this, right? And it's exactly the same information. It takes half the, the amount of pages. But in addition, I made an ebook, um, which isn't even here anymore. Oh, there it is. Oh, so this is how it looks on iPod, right? Now the point is, this should be standard. We should have you know semantic formats, which should be easy, and it shouldn't be handwriting XML or LaTeX. It should be you know uh, something built into Word or whatever. And there are examples. So there are people experimenting with that. It's not quite mature yet, but. When you're submitting a PhD thesis, they shouldn't be checking if your margins are two centimeters, and if this, they should be checking that you use the right style for the body text and the header and whatever. Then they can apply whatever style sheet they want, and you can apply, you know, so you can click one button and you've got an EPUB, 
you've got a PDF, you've got an HTML version, you've got a, a cell phone version, right? And then you could start looking at making the content more semantic. So for example, you were talking about citations, right? The problem with citations is that you could have a paper that's completely wrong and 50 people cite it to say how wrong it is and that person gets an incredibly high citation count. So there's experiments now with semantic citations. So you, in the citation, you actually tell them why are you citing. So are you citing this because it's a literature review? That's another problem. Literature review articles get you know, 200 citations. I mean, it's important to write literature review articles, but it doesn't mean you're the most cutting edge scholar in the field, right? Or, so are you refuting it? Or are you building on it as evidence? And if you have those kind of semantic links, and if you have actually unique ideas for each paper and stuff like that, you can start doing really interesting kind of automatic maps of the field, right? So, that allows the, uh, the scholarship to uh, move beyond just that publication that comes out six months after you've been worrying about it. And you've got lots of scholarship to why. Two of the two I do is to tag the citations under, like, why. Right, right. Yeah. It's definitely a big deal. Yeah. Like, are you feeding it? Are you testing it? Are you challenging it? Are you building on it? Are you supporting it? Like, you can just think of like, so many different things. When you cite something, like, I can think of a dozen different reasons why I would cite a certain amount yeah. uh, of a certain piece of information. And that's important. And it would be like, like annotated citations is a crazy idea. But in, in the context of having a document where, you know, our whole method of citations, too, in, in an academic paper is, is so strange because, like, why should you not, why would, why would we not have a hypertext thesis in which if, 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 if all the citations were open source, it would be like a Wikipedia. Every academic paper would be like a Wikipedia article because every citation would be backtrace that directly to the article in context, rather than having to, you know, look it up until you can see it and explore it from there. So, right? so going back to this, so going back to this example, and hopefully this works, another live demonstration. Um, so this is something, so this is actually generated automatically by someone who's reading a PDF, who's highlighting text and exporting, and so it automatically inserts the page number there. Uh, again, this is uh, not my website, this is Crescentia's website. If I'm looking at that website, I showed you already that I can import the citation and the PDF automatically because it's linked to it. But actually, I can do even better than that. And I can say, hey, she had some idea on page six. I want to see what that idea was. If I click on that link and things work, which they don't always, it's automatically downloading the PDF and opening it to page six. Okay? Yeah. Now, again, like, why isn't that standard? When I'm reading it, like, okay, he's citing this person. I want to click on that link and get that PDF, not only the full PDF, but open it to the right page and, then, yeah, and yeah. give it and highlight the section that he actually disagreed with, right? And, and imagine too, if you could build in all the tracking tools, like how fascinating it would be if I cite Cassandra in a paper and someone reads my paper, <laughs> clicks on my citation for Cassandra, and you find out that, you know, all these people are reading your paper or something, like, or back facing it, and then we can pump that into one of those 3D visualizers, and you then see, you know, people are reading this article because they're being, they're coming to it from here, and then they're going here. And so, going okay, here. okay, let's, let's hold that thought. Yeah. Okay, getting to the 11.3. So this is one of the topics that we could discuss in the, in the, in this work, in the uh, breakout groups. So we'll have, we'll have a break for about, uh, yeah. uh, uh, let's say, five minutes, and then we'll uh, think about, how, so that we'll have these uh, three domains. Uh, we'll have, uh, Would you want to do there if you're there, and then the final would be this larger uh, issue of you know extended scholarship. So just just to war I don't know some I hate when one of my windows is playing music. I don't know which one, uh, but I actually started thinking. Well, I've probably been thinking about this for many years, but I kind of started thinking about this uh, in a KMDI class yeah. where we had the chance to do kind of a future um, design scenario. And uh, so this was kind of uh, using, so the technique I used, which could be useful for you in the future, was using ScreenFlow and using existing applications, but editing it and kind of you know, doing things behind the scenes. So it looked like there was all kinds of built-in functionality that wasn't actually there. 
to kind of demonstrate this is how the world could work. And I think it's quite, so I'm just gonna, this whole video is online, I'll link to it from the blog, but I'll just play like a few seconds. And I still don't know where my music is coming from though. What is that music? No idea. But either way, the point was that I would uh, do all these uh, highlights and then it would show in this nice visualization and it would show these different papers that I've been re reading. And then it would, I would click on relate and it would actually be able to say, here's all these papers cited by these papers you just read. You know, so if you read five papers, they all cite, cite the same paper. That paper is probably relevant to you. So there we go. Yeah, so, so and I, again, I just drew all this and kind of stopped and started it, right? This doesn't actually happen, but it's exactly your idea. Like, why can't we just do this? And then, of course, I find that, you know, a lot of them cited the same paper, so I click a button and boom, it's downloaded all the papers by that author. This isn't quite possible, but that was kind of what inspired me to actually start building something that, you know, that was actually functional.